sports show that talks about sports and other topics relatable to sports fans. I'm joined with my co-host, Harris Berger. What's up, everybody? He's a consistent guest, uh, guest host now, so uh, we, we can drop the guest and we could just uh, go co-host. My name is Alfonso Caldero, and uh, I'm going to kick it to Harris, and he's going to start off with uh, a sport that we've never talked about before, the great sport of golf. Super Bowl of what? golf this weekend. Super Bowl of golf Super Bowl this weekend. Of golf we, this got, weekend. we have the illustrious Masters Tournament. All right, the Masters Tournament, normally played in March, April. This is, this is the big one for, golf, for golfers, golf fans, everybody. All right. Last year, we saw the comeback of, of the greatest to ever play, Tiger Woods. We saw his comeback last year. Tiger, Tiger Woods, y'all. And we get, to, <laughs> we get to see him kick off again this year. Uh, they started this morning. They started with a three-hour weather delay, actually, to, get, to kick things off, which is classic 2020, right? We're gonna, <laughs> and we had to move it. This is the first time the Masters are being played in – November. Out, any month outside of March or April, this is the first time the Masters are taking place. It's going to be interesting to see with these guys, how the conditions are, the course. A lot of golf fans like some particular guys, but most golf fans root for the course, right? They, like to, they want the course conditions to be tough on these guys. They want to see what kind of uh, issues that guys run into. This course is going to play wet all week. There's rain in the forecast most of the week for these guys. It's going to be interesting to see. It's going to be it's going to be a benefit to the guys who carry the ball the furthest. You know, when we talk about carrying the ball off the tee, it's how long they can how long they can shoot that golf ball. You know, and you got guys like Bryson DeChambeau, John Rahm, those guys who can really hit the ball are the guys that are going to benefit this weekend because the balls are going to stick into the fairways, stick on those greens. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. It's also the first time without fans, so you don't really have that atmosphere type. Super Bowl like atmosphere that this that this tournament brings, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see. You got a lot of nice big names on the card today. They got a good round in there. Guys still finishing up actually as we record, uh, but as of right now, uh, we've got a lot of good picks. You like anybody this weekend coming in? Um, all right, so there's 93 names on the uh, on the roster list, and I picked out Adam Scott. Uh, 40 years old, 14 uh, PGA Tour wins, and uh, 2013 Masters win. Uh, it's a 40 to one shot, and um, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not really that much into golf. I, I looked at a uh, CBS, and they said don't sleep on this guy. So I was like, all right, let's let's not sleep on this guy. And then um, I just uh, looked at a couple of different names, and the other one was uh, Jason Day, uh, 33 years old, 12 career. PGA Tour wins, and he was 33-1. to one. Um, I, Australian, and I think that um, it, it, one of these guys can make it happen. It's interesting you picked two Australians. I did. Both of them are Australian. Right. Uh, both guys <laughs> have never won the Masters before. Jason Day has won a major. I be, he won the PGA Championship a couple years ago. I believe he's won one other major, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we do have the defending champion, Tiger Woods, coming back today. Uh, shooting a personal record at Augusta with a minus four sixty eight today, uh, he finished up a couple hours ago. Uh, great round for Tiger, his first bogey free round in a major since two thousand nine. So you're talking about a guy who looks healthy finally coming back to defend his major championship, trying to get one more close to Sam Snead to break that all time record. It it definitely he set himself up nicely on the first day to to build momentum into the weekend. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, with the TV aspect and how the fans react because normally around when the Masters are played, there's not much to watch, right? The hockey season's starting to wind down. Baseball's just kicking off. Basketball's in the swing of things as well. But there's now you got to compete against football. And you don't have to compete against just NFL football, which we know America First loves their NFL football, but college football. And you look at where the Masters is being played down in Augusta, Georgia, that's SEC country. And that <laughs> is college football country, right? That Bible Belt down there in the south. And, and those guys love their, love their football. So we'll see kind of where the TV ratings come. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit next week when the numbers come out. Um, we actually had a hole-in-one earlier this week. Uh, John Rahm had a hole-in-one in a practice round. He actually skipped a ball across the lake. And up onto the green and down the down into into the hole, which was wild to watch. It'll be one of those 
uh, one of those greatest shots that never counted type of things. And it'll, be, it'll be a clip for a long time to come. We'll see how it goes. One of the main storylines heading into this weekend is can Augusta hold Bryson DeChambeau? This is a guy who carries the ball 340-plus yards. Some, if the conditions are right, he can drive the green on almost any hole he wants. Uh, today he did not look good, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, he was spraying the ball left and right, really couldn't match his speed to where the ball needed to go. Uh, he swings real hard. Guy that put on 40-something pounds out of nowhere just by eating protein shakes. Well, that's what he says. I don't know. They don't drug test in <laughs> golf, so <laughs> no one really knows how that goes. I like this weekend. I like John Rahm. Uh, John Rahm's built quite a bit of momentum heading into this weekend. I liked the hole-in-one in the practice round. It gave him that confidence, that lucid feeling coming into the weekend. But Tiger isn't someone to sleep on. He's ch he loves Augusta. The conditions are good for him. As long as he can keep that back healthy and, and keep to his game plan, which he did today, I think it'll be another one. The one other thing to look at are the young guys. This course is, can play very well to the young group coming up in the sport. Justin Thomas, Matt Wolf, Xander Shoffley, Colin Morikawa. Uh, a couple of these guys, Matt Wolf, Colin Morikawa, were spectators last year. They weren't even invited to the Masters. They weren't even on tour yet. Uh, Matt Wolf has built quite a bit of a following. He has a weird swing, not a traditional style golfer. Uh, and then you got the big names, Justin Thomas, like I mentioned, and Brooks Kepka, who Brooks was the number one player in the world recently. Um, just, he lost that a little bit earlier this year when Rory took it back over. And now John Rahm and Dustin Johnson. Uh, so just rolling into the weekend, Tiger, as of where we sit today, Tiger's f three shots off the lead with Xander Shoffley, Webb Simpson, and Paul Casey looking down at him. Um, so we've got the young, just the young name I just mentioned in Xander Shoffley, who has been there in a lot of these big tournaments, but he's never been able to finish. And you got Finau, Rahm at minus three. Um, Paul Casey, as I mentioned, Lee Westwood, and Justin Thomas, all at minus four. So these guys are all right there in, in the mix. We're only day one into this, but by Sunday, someone will be wearing a new green jacket, or Tiger will win back-to-back. -back. Hasn't been done in, I believe it was the, in 45 years or so. Nobody's won back-to-back -back Masters tournaments. Um, the last note I have is Bryson DeChambeau is trying to become the first, since Jordan Spieth did it, um, Ten years or five years ago, excuse me, to win back-to-back -back majors. Jordan Spieth, uh, for those golf fans, will remember he won the U.S. Open and the Masters back-to-back. -back. Now you can flip-flop it. Bryson DeChambeau won the U.S. Open recently, and now he can win the Masters and win major championships back-to-back. -back. It's going to be a fun weekend of golf. This is the Super Bowl of golf, as we mentioned, and um, no better champion than Tiger Woods when it comes to it comes to golf. All right, so you got two guys. Who do you got? I'm going to go with Rom, and I'm going to go with Tiger. I think it's hard to count Tiger out, especially with what he did today. Um, he set himself up nicely in the, going into the weekend. Last year, he shot a 70 in the first round. He's already two strokes under that, set a personal record today. The conditions at the course are a lot in his favor. Um, I think that he, as long as he continues to play well, keep the ball straight, um, he, he was putting pretty well today. He missed a birdie putt to, be, to go five under. Uh, for the round on 18 today, but uh, he can and probably will be there right at the end, as as most of us expect. The other player, I'm going to cheat a little bit. The third guy I want to watch is JT, Justin Thomas, uh, University of Alabama guy, uh, was Mr. Golf Kentucky when he was a kid. This kid is the real deal. He and he'll he'll be there. He'll win a Masters for sure, and it could be this year. And I think he might be right there at the end. So. I think it would be good if uh, somebody hasn't won, who hasn't won in a, a while or hasn't won ever, would win. That would be the most compelling. Except uh, Tiger, I'd like to see Tiger win it. Yeah, all. get get closer to that that all time record when he, he's chasing down Sam Snead. If I'm not mistaken, I didn't write it down, but I think he's only maybe three or four more away from tying that record. So. Yeah, it was looking like a slam dunk, and then he uh, went off of the, the yeah, rails a little, little bit. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now he went off back. the rails yeah. a little bit. He fell off yeah. the wagon, so to speak, and then he had the back issues. So uh, now he's getting to the tail end of his career possibly. I mean, as long as he can stay healthy, this is a guy that can play well into his 50s like Phil's doing now. Yeah, um, Yeah. Th th those were two names that I saw that was pretty cool. It was uh, Phil Mickelson is still there and yep. Fred Couples. 
Yeah, Freddie comes in every now and again and, and sneaks in, but Freddie's ch- hanging out on the Champions Tour now. Um, Phil refuses to go to the Champions Tour. He just likes to compete, and we all love to watch Phil and his crazy shots that he finds himself in and, and, and does a pretty good job getting out of. So that that's golf talk, everybody. And uh, Woo! we'll be here next week to, when, when we'll crown a Masters champion. We'll go over that real quick, but I think we're in for a good weekend of golf. All right. So, yeah. So uh, we're going to switch gears to the NBA draft uh, coming up next Wednesday. So by the time we uh, head on air next week, there will be um, a couple of new NBA players that are crowned. So uh, what do you got there? You know what was interesting? I was looking through some of these prospects, and there's no real consensus number one pick. You know, that like LaMelo Ball is the big name that's on there, but that's because of his dad and his brother, right? His brother, and, yeah. um, the big baller brand is supposed to come back out, you know. And, yeah. But it was interesting. There's The last few years in the NBA, there's always been that consensus number one pick, right? The guy that stands out above everybody else, the generational talent. You really don't have that this year. Um, it'll be interesting to see. The other thing I noticed was – there's three international prospects inside the top five. So the Lamelo's one of them. Uh, you have three international prospects, another from Germany and another from Israel, actually, um, who plays in Tel Aviv, who these are guys that didn't go, obviously didn't go the college route, and it kind of makes you wonder uh, with the NCAA rules and regulations, some of these guys go start making money now, start getting their name out there. They're still getting the same amount of draft clout as what they would get playing college basketball so uh interesting to see it's going to be interesting to see kind of where what where, what teams decide to do here you know yeah um, international players are the most they're all the riskiest yeah but ball. they're but a lot of them um two of the three international prospects are from the u.s if i'm not mistaken lamella ball being one of them um the one that plays in germany I, the name escapes my mind but um i believe he's also from the u.s and these are guys that just didn't go the college route, went to go play uh, internationally, start making money, and who can blame them, right, with the way that the NCAA is set up. Yeah. And, um, especially now, I mean, with March Madness getting cut short this year, you don't get that showcase that you would normally get. Uh, it'll be interesting to see and, and where teams might make moves, who might come back, who might trade up. It'll be interesting to see. What do you think? Um, I'd say with that explanation is definitely better cuz you know you're playing against grown men you're not really playing against uh other college people so the the learning curve would definitely help there um as far as the 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 number one consensus goes i think i agree that there's no actual number one uh no clear cut number one uh one thing i'll say is that it's pretty much it pretty much comes down to what do you need? Because right now it looks like the the, the three top uh, players are Lamar, uh, Lamelo Ball, who is a six six point guard. Yeah, sounds Big pretty for a point guard. Yeah, that yeah. sounds pretty good. Sounds like kind of Shaq like for a point guard. Yeah, and then um, you got James Wiseman, who's a seven one center. Looks, you know, if if you need a dominant center, then that would be the the, the route that you'd want to go, especially in this day and age where it seems like the, the dominant centers are not what they used to be, you know, there's not. Yeah. The game's gotten away from that. Yeah. Big center, you yeah. Know? There's not a lot of uh, controlling, you know, like 2010 kind of players, you know? Yep. And then, um, Anthony Edwards, who's a six, five, uh, point guard. I mean, sorry, a shooting guard. Yeah. Uh, th- that was the big name that I heard a lot last year. And I don't know where his stock kind of fell a little bit. That seemed to be like the, the, the number one consensus pick. And then, um, I guess ball kind of like, you know, the, the name really gets you going over there. Yeah, that's who I – and Anthony Edwards and LaMelo were the two guys on my list, right? And you look at teams that – where do, what do they need? And we kind of – you can get into the argument. You meant you brought up what do you do in these situations, right? Do you look at who the best position players are, best available guys, or do you go based on need? Generally, in most sports, you draft based on need. Basketball really hasn't quite been that way. Recently, I mean, you look at uh, most of the time when you're drafting, it's because you're bad, right, in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. And you need a superstar. You look at the Pelicans and getting Zion, right, and turning that team around. Um, well, now, you, you, yeah. uh, I think one of the biggest uh, drafting on need blunders was uh, all the way back in, uh, what was it, 1983 when um, Michael Jordan was selected. and then 86. But, 86. So – 
Sam Sam See, Bowie was yeah. was selected uh, by the Portland Trailblazers because they didn't need a shooting guard because they had uh, Clyde Dressler. Or more recently, when Portland drafted Greg Oden and Seattle got uh, Kevin Durant. Yeah, yeah. So you you who the, won that? So basically, it's what do you what do you do? Um, I'd say like best available is always the way to go because there's also there's always the trade market and things like that, but. You know, with the uh, th- these are franchise. You know, if if you make a mistake, this sets you back like five to ten years. So yeah, just look at James Dolan in the Knicks. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at they draft Porzingis, and everybody hated the pick, and this guy turned into a superstar in New York, and then they got rid of him for whatever reason. Um, but you kind of look at who's in the top five, top ten. Um, the Knicks are sitting at eight. Do they make a move to come up? What do you think? Um, I would love that, but w- w- what do you trade? Like, they, they, they really don't have – I don't think they have the pieces. Well, you're going to have to trade. They, they you have, would definitely trade the eighth pick. Yeah, they, well, they have two number ones. Uh, they have a late number one. So you probably uh, need to get rid of both. Yeah. Um, I, I don't I, – I mean, the Knicks have so many needs. That I don't think it's really worth trying to The trade one up. thing I would be interested to see is if the Knicks trade up to get LaMelo. You're talking about James Dolan, Madison Square Garden – Bright lights, big market, and they, they can't throw enough money at stars to come. So they this might is, as well try I mean, to. This is a guy that's going to put butts in seats. You know, I mean, granted, as long as they can have fans, right? Um, let's talk about a perfect world where we yeah. can sell the garden back out. Right. Lamelo's a guy that's going to do that for you, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the Knicks trade up. I wouldn't be surprised to see Golden State trade out. They have the second overall pick. They were bad. Mostly due to injury. Well, yeah. Steph Curry missed a lot of the season. Klay Thompson missed a lot of the season. They're, they're going to be like when Tim Duncan, uh, the way they got Tim Duncan, where right. David Robinson was out, and then they ended up getting the number one pick, and then turned into Tim Duncan, and then David <laughs> Robinson came back. It was like, you know, basically you had your stud team right there, and then it started a dynasty. Yeah, I mean, could you, could you imagine adding adding James Wiseman to that, adding a 7-1 center with yeah. the Splash Brothers on the outside? That you're talking about setting up another championship run or three for the Golden State yeah. Warriors. But, but, but with, the, with the salary cap and the salary cap crunch that is coming to the yeah. Golden State Warriors, they might as well keep the pick and get a stud because yeah. uh, he'll be, he'll be the, they'll be able to control him for maybe like three years before the, the contract goes up. Uh, Absolutely. Goes out, so. And the one other team I have on my list to make a move are the Boston Celtics, my Boston Celtics. Boston. Yo, let me tell you something about the Boston Celtics. Like how – like it seems like every year they have three first-round picks. Like, Danny just, Ainge. They just – they always Danny Ainge stockpile. Danny is a wizard. They always stockpile on, on first-round picks. It's, it's insane. It's oh, 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 incredible. I did the um, – well, when I was breaking down the draft uh, a couple months uh, – well, the, uh, the lottery – I was breaking it down, and I saw that. I was like, the Celtics had three picks. I'm like, what the? They, yep. Wow. And they have three first-round picks and guys with contracts coming up. Yeah. Um, Gordon Hayward uh, is the big name. A lot of people say, a lot of news and pundits say that he wants out of Boston. Here's a guy you might want to trade. Get a Drew Holiday. Get a guy... Get rid of some of those first round picks to trade up into the top five. Or get more first round picks for future years. <laughs> or That's both, right? Do. And Danny yeah. Ainge is a wizard when it comes to negotiating trades. And um, there's a reason why the Celtics became who they were and, and were able to, to be good for so yeah. long. The, right? the, their Eastern Conference Finals roster, the, they had, it was littered with first round picks. Yep. It, was just, it was insane. And, and you, bring back, you bring back Jason Tatum. You, I personally would like to see Kemba Walker come back. I don't think that I would like to see him traded. Oh, then he didn't sign a long term deal? He did, but he's on the, they say he's on the bubble maybe to be traded. Uh, is a package deal. Remember a couple years ago they sent uh, uh, Paul Pierce and uh, Kevin Garnett over to Brooklyn for a slew of first-round picks, which turned into Jason Tatum right. um, and uh, and uh, Brown as well. So uh, Yeah, we remember that one. Yeah, that was- so uh, <laughs> the Celtics find ways to just reload, right? They don't rebuild, they reload. And yeah. um, it continues to that trend this year in Boston and, and – Probably looking at another Eastern Conference Finals appearance is what we're looking at for them. It's going to be interesting to see as well. We got NBA free agency coming up too. We'll have that in a couple of weeks, but um, it'll be interesting to see kind of where they go before they kick off in December. I, I like the fact that they do the drafts before the free agency starts, which uh, the the um, the NHL did too. And I think it's just the smartest way because you 
if you did it the other way around, you would be signing and then you'd have like, you, you wouldn't have the same kind of need. Mm-hmm. So it kind of just keeps the doors open. You see what you get in the draft, and then all, all of a sudden, uh, the football actually does it the other way around. I think they they do the uh, maybe the draft first. They they, they do no, the, they do the free agent signing first, don't they? I don't think so. Huh. We're gonna have to, have to <laughs> gonna have to check on that. Come back uh, on the next show. I'm pretty sure because the, the the free agent because in the NFL the, the free agency period starts. I'm pretty sure it starts. Normally, before. the NFL draft is almost right after the Super Bowl. It's usually a I, couple th- weeks I thought it was right like after. April. Yeah, so February, to, you have a couple of weeks off, and then April. And then I believe right and after that after is when that? free agency starts. That's, a, that's yeah. like a three-month gap. Though. Yeah. I don't know. Well, we'll check on that Speaking for of week. the NFL, we had an interesting Monday night game. Very interesting. Jets moved to 0-9. Very interesting. Um, my Patriots walked into uh, MetLife, and frankly, they stole one. Uh, probably didn't deserve to win that game. The Jets uh, – the Jets jetted, actually, is what happened. You yep. know, they, yep. they, blew a, they blew a healthy lead in what, the second point half. 10-point lead with, like, six minutes left? Yep, Adam awesome. Gaze did what Adam Gaze does. He called a good first half and then no points in the second half. And um, just an interesting way to, to call a game. And you think, oh, maybe he's part of the tank. The, the, the tank is fully on here in New York. And tank for, tank for Trevor. I'd say going into this, um, going into this game, I was wondering if Belichick would maybe try to – throw a wrench in the whole thing with, you know, the fact that they are they don't have a great record and they're really not going to go anywhere if you look at the, the grand scheme of the super strong AFC. But I was wondering if they would go and maybe lay an egg so that the the Jets kind of, like, throw a wrench in their plans of, you know, not the, the Patriots not having to face, like, a Trevor Lawrence, that's, uh, theoretically, uh, for the next 10 years as a New York Jet. Um or until the Jets trade him because they can't build talent once yeah. they draft it. <laughs> um, so I don't, I, you know. And then it just ended up like the way the, the way the game unfolded was basically like the Patriots just spotted the points and then like, oh, let, 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 let me let me show you what I could do. And then they yeah. ended up just coming back. It was it was the one storyline I think coming out of that game was I think Cam Newton got better. I think Cam Newton was really just one of those like victims of COVID-19 because he was rolling in the beginning of the season, mm-hmm. almost beat uh, Kansas City and things like that. And then he, well, he was out for that game. Was that he? was the game he missed because of COVID. Nah. Yeah. What, what, what was, what was the, the, the one? The, the Seattle. One. They got stopped oh, okay, on the one-yard yeah, yeah. line against Seattle. They almost came back. I knew it was a powerhouse Buffalo. team. That you yeah. Almost and, beat, you yeah. know, it, we got some interesting ones on the schedule this weekend. We talk about the Patriots um, welcoming Lamar Jackson and, and the, the Ravens into town. That's a scary one for Patriots fans is because just how good Lamar Jackson is. Well, the Ravens in a whole is just a well-oiled machine. Yeah, their defense is is a typical Ravens defense. You look back to those Ray Lewis, Ed Reed days, and they, they show signs of that again. And Rex Ryan. Yeah, they show signs of that <laughs> again, and uh, it'll be interesting. Tonight we got Colts-Titans. How do you like that one? Uh, I'm going to say Titans just because – how could you bet on, on Derrick Henry? Like just that, that guy, I'm such a fan of that guy just because he's, like we talked about in the last week's show, he's just he's just powerful, man. Like from the running back position, he controls the game, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And he makes Ryan Tannehill worth a damn. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, 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 nobody's going to convince me that Ryan Tannehill is like a great quarterback. It's just not going to happen. I don't think Ryan Tannehill is a great quarterback, but I think Ryan Tannehill is a better quarterback than people give him credit for, and you included. And Ryan Absolutely. Tannehill needed to get out from underneath Adam Gase. Now he's out from underneath Adam Gase. He's under Mike Vrabel. Mike Vrabel comes from that Bill Belichick coaching tree. Uh, well, I'm, I'm he a was big coached fan of- by Bill Belichick. He didn't. I don't think he. Well, I guess he worked with them for a little while before he went to Houston. I'm also a big fan of Mike Vrabel. Actually, now that you mention it, because Mike Vrabel's just, really good. He seems like one of those like no nonsense. Like we're gonna get this done. And I don't want to hear no. I don't want to hear no crap. Like, yeah, one hundred percent. And yeah. he's also a players' coach. From what you see, he interacts with the guys on the sidelines. He's up there jumping around, jumping into guys. It's it's fun to watch that team work. And he's basically, like a players, co- like a player coach. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, I like the Titans this week too. The Titans actually are a, are a one point underdog at home. Uh, one point or. Home dogs this year are twelve and two against the spread. So give me the Titans. Give me you want to give me points also. I'll take it. But I'm taking Titans money line tonight. The Titans I think are going to walk over them. 
The Colts' defense is good. They are very, with Darius Leonard. Those guys up there, their front seven, are just really good. But they couldn't stop the run. They showed it last week when the Ravens rolled over them. Last week, the offense in Indianapolis just has no identity. Um, Phil Rivers is a placeholder, in my opinion. Um, Jacoby Brissett should be the starting quarterback in Indianapolis, and they just won't really give him quite the opportunity that he deserves. Uh, but I like the Titans. I like Derrick Henry to rush for over 100 tonight. One, to, I would say, give me two touchdowns for Derrick Henry. Ryan Tannehill throwing one or two more, and I like I like the Titans big here. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to agree there. Um, as far as the the whole spectrum of the AFC, mm -hmm. I'd say there's a disparity between who's really good and who's really bad. Um, and uh, we, I, I looked on the uh, the way the a AFC is structured right now and the way the NFC is structured right now. The NFC is kind of like a like a like a like a flat line. You know, like the 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 elite teams are not pulling away. They're not really really good. And um, the bottom teams are kind of just hanging around there. A big thanks to the NFC East for being so <laughs> awful. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> awful. So and then, but the AFC, you got you have the the, the one unbeaten team, the Steelers, who uh, I'm going to assume this week is going to stay undefeated. What do you think? Yeah, I like the Steelers this week too. Uh, as long as Ben plays, Ben was on that COVID list with because uh, he was in close proximity. His locker mate Vance McDonald tested positive. Um, so they kind of had him quarantining. He should be good to go, barring a negative test this week. Um, as long as that happens, I think that they'll be able to roll over the uh, over the Bengals. The Bengals and Joe Burrow have shown signs of life. They are a good team on paper. Um, they are better, in my opinion, than their two and five record. But that Steelers front seven is too good to for to you know, for the Bengals to protect Joe Burrow. Um, as long, if Joe Burrow gets time in the pocket, he can shred any defense, but he's just not going to have that time this week. And I, I think he's, he's doing really well for, uh, for his first season. He's like in the, the, the top five in passing yards. Yeah, he's definitely in the rookie of the year category for me. I think him and, and Justin Herbert for sure um, are my two leading guys in the clubhouse as far as rookie of the years goes. Uh, it, it's interesting. We mentioned the – you kind of mentioned the NFC East a little bit ago. We got Eagles-Giants this weekend. Um the, the Eagles Flip are a coin. Yeah, yeah, right? Um, the Eagles are three-and-a-half-point favorites coming to New York uh, this weekend. They get Miles Sanders back. You kind of you get some of those pieces back. Alshon Jeffrey's been healthy for the first time all season. Carson Wentz gets, a little, gets another weapon back. Carson Wentz is another one who's been healthy all season, right? No, he, Carson Wentz has played all year. He's yeah, just been bad. That's, that's new. Uh, no, I mean, that's new, though. You know, usually you get, like – Plays like the first four games and then goes down, something like that. <laughs> that's so. true. That's true. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you, I like the Eagles. The Giants have been progressing and getting better, even without Saquon. Um, they, showed, they showed that against the Bucks two weeks ago. They had a good game last week. But the Eagles, I think, getting healthy now can, can just run away with that division. Probably still finish 8-8, eight 9-7, and, eight, and, and host a playoff game. They might even finish 7-9 and nine at this point and host a playoff game, which the NFL just needs to change that rule because that's just ridiculous that they can do that. I think nah, I think every every sport has that one kind of team that loopholes through. Because, <laughs> you know, the, how, how else are you supposed to divide it? You know, like, because yeah. then you'd have to get rid of the division format and just keep records and things like that. Then that screws up, like, you know, the tiebreakers. It's just, like, it's just basically just the luck of the draw. It, yeah. it, it, it doesn't happen – all that often, but there's always like one division where somebody sneaks in, and then you ha you had the Houston Astros who uh, from baseball yeah, well. who were under 500 and they made the playoffs just because they were the the second team in the division. Yeah. So, you know, it's just uh, every every team has those kind. Of, uh, every sport has like those kind of like loopholes, sneak in things. That's why the um the NBA actually uh, instead of doing the top three seeds, the mm -hmm. top three division winners, they made the the you know whoever well the NHL used to do it too it by which is the top yeah. eight it used to just be the top eight and that's the NHL needs to go back to that in my opinion um, I think yeah, it's just the, the I, structure. I guess you're right well yeah. it's just it's frustrating when these teams are so bad and they just find ways to get in yeah jumping from the NFC East to the NFC South we got Bucks Panthers this weekend 
Can can the Bucks stop the bleeding? Is what I wrote down here. The Bucks did not have a great game against the Giants, and then they got their doors blown off by the yeah. Saints on Sunday Night Football last week. For uh, so the for the uh, the supremacy of the division. Yeah. For that so one, yeah. can do you? The Bucks are five and a half point favorites going to Carolina this weekend. What do you think? I think the the. I mean, you can't even you can't bet against Tom Brady. Like every every game that Tom Brady's in. You always, I mean, he's always the favorite in my opinion. After watching him, you know, two times a year for about what was it, fifteen years, fourteen, fifteen years, whatever years. it was. Yeah, so <laughs> it was just all, you know, it's just, uh, Tom Brady's Tom Brady. You know, like he's eventually he's gonna figure it all out. I don't, you know, age is age could be catching up with him, but I mean, at, at the end of the day, he's just he's just gonna been figure it out. It for six years that the age he's, is catching up to him and just, just hasn't happened. He's won out. three Super Bowls since then. It's like it's like every it's like uh, I equate it to like. A, a starting pitcher who throws, you know, 98 miles an hour, yeah. and then he ends up losing his fastball. So what does he do? He learns how to, you know, he, he learns other pitches. Like he learns other ways around it. Like yeah. uh, a CC Sabathia, who actually struggled at being an older pitcher up until the last couple of years of his career, where he actually figured out like how to pitch off speed and yeah. how to dominate. And you look at and that's what that, at, that's what Tom Brady's gonna do. Yeah, you look at that Saints matchup last week, and the Bucks defense couldn't stop. Couldn't stop a nosebleed if they wanted to, and that's a defense that's been the, one of the top defenses in the NFC. Uh, Tom Brady, Bruce Arians was very critical of Tom this week, um, saying how wide open Mike Evans was. Uh, a lot of attention was paid to Antonio Brown, who rejoined or signed and played this past week, um, and I think that was Tom's shiny new toy. He got his best friend back. Antonio Brown's living with him down in Tampa, and I think that he was trying to get him a little too involved and wasn't going through his progressions right. And you can see Tom wasn't comfortable. He didn't have a lot of time in the pocket against that Saints front. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Which is probably. the one Achilles heel of Tom Brady, as we know from the uh, yeah. Giants Super Bowls. Yeah, so I, no pop, most likely no Christian McCaffrey for the Panthers this week, which means another week of Mike Davis. Uh, he made his return last week, got hurt again, uh, went from the ankle to the shoulder. Um, actually, I think they said ribs this week for, for Christian McCaffrey. So we'll see if he makes the lineup. I don't think so. I think it's going to be a Mike Davis weekend. Um, I like the Bucks, but I think that the Panthers keep it close. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater has some weapons in Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, former Jet, uh, who they just let walk out the door for nothing. Uh, I'll continue to make that point until I hit it home because he's been really good for that team. Why? Why receivers are a dime a dozen. The the, the Jets have tons of issues. Well, oh, it's you know. Yeah. Well, he's he's, he's no he's Odell, found a home. He, he's no Odell Beckham. That's for sure. Well, Odell's probably Odell's not. Odell's a big name because he made one catch on a Thanksgiving football game. You know, uh, in my opinion, he hasn't really been. I mean, he has he hasn't won anything. But his, his numbers are amazing, though. Sure, his numbers are amazing, but there's plenty of guys I'd pick before I pick him. Um, I won't dance on a guy's grave. He's out with an ACL injury. We can't watch him play for the rest of the yeah. year. He is fun to watch when he does get out there, uh, but just not quite the case. We do have a good rookie matchup this week, and we have the, the four number four and number five picks going at it in Tua and Justin Herbert. We got the Chargers coming to the East Coast to play the Dolphins. Dolphins seem to just luck out this year with their schedule. They played the – they're playing against all these West Coast teams at home. They didn't have to travel anywhere to go play these guys. They had the Rams come into town, the Cardinals come into town. I believe they had to go to Seattle, and I think they lost that game too. But where they they still have to go to Seattle. I'm not sure if they played yet. I haven't, don't, can't remember off the top of my head. The Chargers are two and a half point underdogs coming into the weekend. What do you think? I I do not like. The Dolphins. I, I just I hate do not Dolphins, like. I just their defense I always is, want them to lose. Defense is, yeah, the is Dolphins, good. The defense is really, really good. Uh, actually, I think their defense is what the Bills' defense was supposed to be, yep. and uh, like it just went to Miami, like the the top ranking. And you Brian know. Flores has built a. His, he brought his Patriots defense literally with Kyle Van Noy. Um, and a couple other leaders from the old Patriots Super Bowl. And then they, they, they traded away that one dude to uh, to the Steelers. Yeah, and Minka it, yeah, and it seemed like they were. Town. Yeah, and it seemed like they He's were been just good like for the Steelers. But. Yeah, but it seemed like they were just like mailing it in, and then yeah. they just co- come back with this boombastic defense that just they just basically yeah. keeping them in games and winning games. For they've them. built a good defense, and it's carrying them this season. Um, they rolled over uh, 
they rolled over San Francisco. They rolled. They beat the Rams. Um, they, they've had they, some impressive victories. They just beat Arizona this week. Those are some big name teams that they've beat. Um, I some, think the, the the Chargers. I think are better than their record is. I think yep, that's the I one. Think that's another. That's team. the one team from the 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 weakest of the the AFC. That is just. Yep. I think they're better than the, what the uh, what their record is. So I'm gonna go Chargers. Um, probably Ooh. probably a little biased, but I'm definitely. Um, Definitely say that uh, I, I saw the, the the one game with the quarterback uh, Hibbert? Herbert 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 he he looked really really good and I think oh uh, he's he's looked good in, in other weeks you know he's yeah. you know going through a little bit of the you know game management things which you know obviously is be- uh, that's what's going to happen with rookies yeah. uh, I think uh, the the overall pressure for rookies especially at the quarterback position uh, everybody wants them to be good right away but there is there is also that window of needing to learn and get the experience before they're like really, really dominant. Uh, that's what he's going through right now. Um, let's say, um, you know, I go charges. I like the over in this game. These are two teams. I know we just talked about how good Miami's defense is. And Justin Herbert's played good defenses and he's found ways to score touchdowns. Uh, Tua showed signs of improvement last week from his, from his debut. Looked pretty good. It's going to come down to who's going to get the last stop for me. I think the, the chargers, are going to be there, but I think the Dolphins probably will win this game, but I think that there's going to be a lot of points. Um, I think that both teams have enough in the tank offensively to do it. Uh, the Dolphins get some guys back. They lost Preston Williams this past week uh, to injury, but they do have some other pieces. Tua continuing to run the ball. The Chargers defense has some questions, um, but Justin Herbert, I think, has been really good, and we'll just continue to roll through there. Heading out west... We got Seattle and LA and the Rams going at it for the other team out in LA, going at it for supremacy in the NFC West. What do you think? That's one matchup that seems right now overhyped because of the teams that they've lost to. Like it seemed like the 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 Rams and and Seattle they should be almost having per- perfect records at this point, but they've just laid eggs against uh, bad teams. So we 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 really don't know. Um, What's going to come of this? I'm going to say Seattle just because. Uh, you like Russ to bounce back. I really want. Um, I really want Jamal Adams to do good. Like uh, I've been. I, like I've been hearing some reports that he's not. Uh, he's not doing too well. Had a fight with Pete Carroll inside that last week. With, yeah, had a fight with Pete Carroll and things like that. Um, so that that's a uh, that's going to be a rough one. So let's see if uh, he ends up t- tearing down the team. But I'd say uh, I'm going to go Seattle in that one just because their overall defense could. Um, do good against uh, their offense. Theoretically, we'll, we'll see because they both, you know, b- both teams are just laid eggs. So I, don't, I you know, you really don't, you really don't know what what team's gonna show up. It, yeah, you're 100 percent right. Sides. It's been interesting because you people have talked about the uh, have talked about Seattle and Russell Wilson and how good he's been. But the one thing that I think that team's been able to fly under the radar because he's been so good is the defense has been awful. Huh. And they've just been giving up points and points and points and points, and they just can't stop anything. And you look at a team like the Rams, who have a good defense. It, you got Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey. You got some big names on that team that can get stops and a really good offense. And and yeah, and they have a good offense. They have three good running backs in the backfield: Malcolm Brown, Darren Henderson, and uh, Cam Akers. And then you look at Robert Woods, Cooper Cup. Tyler Higby, you got the guys out in L.A. Those guys can do a good job. Sean McVay, the offensive guru that he is, uh, that's gotten a lot of guys in the league hired over the last few years because of the success that he's had. You know, it's interesting. Russ is starting to get that old Aaron Rodgers treatment, right, Uh, where Aaron has to – Aaron Rodgers always has to play perfect for for the Packers to be good and for the Packers to win games, right? He can't be average. Um, Russ has had some turnover issues over the past couple of weeks. He's thrown seven interceptions, a couple of turnovers, a couple of fumbles. He's got to take care of the ball a little bit better than he has been, a little bit more. He's got the weapons that he needs on the outside with DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett. So he's got the weapons he needs. Probably no Chris Carson again this week, so we'll see a healthy dose of, of rookie running again from Seattle and, and Russ running the ball some more. But, I, you know, I, I like Seattle to bounce back too this weekend, but I think that the Rams cover. It's a one-and-a-half-point spread. 
Um, the Rams are one and a half point. Um, oh, excuse me. The Rams are one and a half point favorites. So I think Seattle's going to win this game outright. It's almost a pick 'em game. Probably by Sunday, this game will drop down uh, to a pick 'em, or it might even swing into uh, to at Seattle to be the favorites coming in on Sunday. All right. So oh, I got a, I got I got a question for you. So. Out of these teams, we have the Minnesota Vikings, the Detroit Lions, uh, Atlanta Falcons, Carolina Panthers, and San Francisco 49ers. 49ers are four and five. Uh, Vikings three and five. Lions three and five. Uh, Falcons three and six, and Carolina three and six. Which one of those teams do you think can make the playoffs in the kind of feeble NFC? Man, go through those one more time. Give me the names again. All right, again. so Vikings, Lions, Falcons, Panthers, 49ers. None. <laughs> um, but if, if, you, if you look at the, the – all right, so the NFC right now has the Packers, the Saints, so Seattle, the only, the and name, Buccaneers yeah. that look like they're locks to get in. Right. Then you have the teetering ones, the Bears, the Cardinals, the Rams. And then you have the NFC East where one of those four got to make it. So the, we're going to have an expanded playoff more than likely this year. Um, it could even expand into a 16-team playoff, which would be crazy if there's another cancellation of games or if something drastic has to change with the schedule. So we, we'd have to assume at that point that either the Bears, the Cardinals, or the Rams end up dropping out. In my opinion, the name that jumps out at me the quickest was Minnesota. Minnesota's starting to play good football. Dalvin Cook's back. He's healthy. He's tearing it up. Right, he had another 200-yard game last week, back-to-back 200-yard games. He's got, what, like six touchdowns in the last two weeks. Um, that team's starting to roll through. The Bears can't figure it out on offense. Um, Ryan Pace doesn't know what he's doing. The coach in, in Chicago, whose name isn't even worth mentioning, but I'll do it anyway, <laughs> Matt Nagy, turns over his play calling, uh, yeah, which is probably know, good because he can't even pick his head up out of his own play sheet to make a good call. Yeah, I know a couple of uh, Bears fans that I see them on Facebook, and they just like replace Nagy like every week, yeah, multiple times and during a game. Mitch Trubisky's still hurt. Uh, he's more than likely out still. He's, I mean, he hasn't. He's been taken out, which everyone that was a wild move when taking out a three and zero quarterback, putting in Nick Foles. Uh, Nick Foles won one game one year, and now he becomes a stud, right? And we'll. Um, but that offense just hasn't been able to go anywhere. That defense has lifted them up drastically. Minnesota is a team that is turning it around. Their defense is starting to pick it up. Kirk Cousins is starting to find his groove again. Those Justin Jefferson is a good rookie wide receiver. Adam Thielen leading that team. It's all centered around Dalvin Cook. As long as they can keep running the football, Minnesota is going to be a good football team. And they're more than likely the team, I think, that can get in. I'm going to go of Falcon. Those teams. Go Falcons just because they've already proven that they could win like 55 minutes of a game before losing at the end, and eventually and now they have gonna, no coach. Eventually they're gonna figure it out. Well, I mean they they they, they still have the weapons on the offense. They still have uh, Matt Ryan. They got a uh, Julio Jones. They got um, Gurley over there. You know, part time but still there. So that 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 would be who I think uh, out of all these teams who would have a chance again. They only because. 49ers are just ravaged by injuries. I mean, I think yeah. if they had the whole roster, we wouldn't even mention the name at this point. But unfortunately, like they've been really hit hard. And you're looking at another situation for the 49ers where a couple years ago when Jimmy G hurt his knee and they went 2-14 and 14 and they got the second overall pick or first overall pick, they got Nick Boza. Yeah. You're looking at that situation for them again. And now, and both now they're going to be able to add another good yeah. – they're going to be able to add another good top-level pick because I think they're going to be right there at the end for a top five, top ten pick where they can make moves, and I think that they're going to make some changes this offseason uh, as well. More than likely, I'm looking at you, Matt Ryan, heading out west Woo! to San Francisco. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. We'll, we'll visit that at the end of the year. But I like Minnesota. I think, I, I think the Falcons are too inconsistent right now where they're too up and down for me to be able to put confidence in them. But you're right. They do have a lot of good weapons still. Um, with, as long as Julio Jones can st- and those guys can stay healthy, Matt Ryan can continue to throw the ball with confidence. You've seen some times where he gets hit and he doesn't like it. But, yeah, I think we'll be pretty good. All right. So we're going to move over. we got about five minutes left in the show. We're going to move on to some college football. We're trying to work into the college football more. Uh, into the show because it is a, a huge uh, aspect of sports. So 
What do you got for us? Boy, college football got ravaged hard by COVID-19 this weekend. Three of the top five teams are inactive as of today because no, of no COVID-19. There. Um, Alabama, LSU, which is always a big game, postponed due to COVID. OSU, Maryland, canceled due to COVID. So that, and that's a big blow. Ohio State losing another game off of their schedule in an already short season is a basically a, a blemish on their resume to try to get into the college football playoff, um, even though they probably would have rolled over Maryland pretty handedly. Uh, they don't get to show that, right? So it's one less game on tape for the committee to show, and we're going to be we're going to be getting committee rankings here shortly. Uh, where the, the the standings will go out the window and it'll be all about the college football playoff committee rankings. So we'll see where that goes. Texas A&M, who's a top five team now, playing great football under Jimbo Fisher. Uh, their, their game against Tennessee postponed. Georgia coming off their loss to Florida in, in Jacksonville uh, postponed due to COVID. Auburn and Mississippi State postponed due to COVID. So those are four, there's four SEC games alone postponed one big 10 game or there's actually two big 10 games canceled two more pac 12 games canceled as well um, rolling into the weekend um, just going over last weekend first clemson number one clemson goes down to notre dame in double overtime uh, great one of the one of the best football games uh to take place in quite a while actually Last year's Alabama LSU game was one to remember. This is another one to follow that up. Uh, Clemson did not have Trevor Lawrence. He was out with that. Um, he had, had tested positive the week and sat out the week prior. They said uh, his cardio wasn't ready to play in this game. He traveled with the team. He was on the sidelines, but he w- did not play. Um, Uyunglele played. I got that right. DJ Uyunglele. I'm a proud of that one. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, he played a great game, looked really good for the Tigers. They just – the refing in that game to me stood out because it was just – for both sides, it was horrible. The ACC has had an issue with refing for a long time. That Both teams are part of the ACC conference this year. Uh, normally, Notre Dame is an independent team, for those who don't know. The only independent team in the country that's not a um, armed, services, armed services academy, military academy. So – what that did to the rankings basically just pushed Alabama up, pushed Notre Dame up, and pushed everyone up behind them. Um, Clemson doesn't fall too far. They're still in the mix. They'll see each other again most likely in the ACC championship game. Um, we'll kind of see how it goes. Rolling into the weekend, Wisconsin gets to make their comeback. Wisconsin played week one October on October 23rd, blew out Illinois on Friday night, and then hadn't played since because of COVID. They come back this weekend against Michigan, who's a one and three team. A lot of people are calling for Jim Harbaugh's job. Uh, he just hasn't cut it. They just got blown out by Indiana, who is a basketball school. Uh, they are not by any means a football school. Uh, Wisconsin, in my opinion, is going to roll over them. They're still ranked 13th. USC with the Pac-12, they snuck out a win last week against Arizona State uh, with a good comeback onside kick recovery and a touchdown to win it at the end. They go to Arizona this weekend. Uh, to play the University of Arizona, Nick Foles, old school. I like USC this weekend as well. Clemson's on a bye. They got Florida State next week, so they'll be able to basically just get back-to-back bye weeks. Uh, They're going to roll over Florida State in that game. Notre Dame has BC, which BC has been a team that's been good and bad. Boston College is building something. They played Clemson really well until the fourth quarter. Uh, Had them pretty handedly – on the ropes in this in the first half of that game, I like BC to cover in this game, but I think Notre Dame will continue to win. Will continue on to win. You got two unbeaten's left that are the Cinderellas this year. Coastal Carolina, the Chanticleers have a fun program. They have they have teal turf, which is fun to watch if you've never seen it on TV. Uh, down in Myrtle Beach, they have a fun program where they just continue to beat the doors off of teams and. Um, and it's fun to watch them. Cincinnati's another team out in the American Conference, which is probably when you talk about the Power Five conferences, the American Conference is probably that sixth conference, right? That's where UCF is, USF, Navy. You talk about those other bigger name schools that aren't in the Power Five. Cincinnati's one of those teams where 
they could potentially, depending on how the year goes, this year has been so wild, the committee might say, you know what, Cincinnati, you continue to win out. We'll put you in the top four and see how you do. But if they get matched up with one of these big teams, we'll see why that they're the American Conference and they're not in the ACC or the Big Ten like some of these big schools are because they're going to get their doors blown off. But they're a fun team to watch. That Cincinnati team um, has a good quarterback. He's probably going to be one of the bi one of the better quarterbacks taken in the draft. Uh, he's been good. They play East Carolina this weekend. I like for both of those teams to win, to win easily, to cover both of those games on their respective gambling lines. And Cincinnati's a 27.5-point favorite, and I still think that they're going to cover that game pretty handedly. Um, yeah, so that's that's college football. All right, uh, we'll I can't I can't wait on that one. I can't wait to hear the uh, the corruption stories and all that from actually who makes the playoffs and who doesn't make the playoffs. Yeah, it's gonna be a mess. So that does it for our show this week. Uh, Co-hosting today is uh, uh, Harris Berger, and my name is Alfonso Caldero, and we'll see you next week. LDM Radio Sports Talk.